Sometimes I'm, I'm really, really, really tired, but uh, still I cannot sleep. <clears throat> I can't use that time for anything productive because I'm tired. But I cannot sleep, and so after a while I'm bored and I need to occupy my mind. And usually what I do is I zap through YouTube. There are great videos. So people put together plastic models with great enthusiasm. Or people convert an ambulance into an RV. And the great innovation at the moment in ambulance converting seems to be the incinerating toilet. And as I write this sermon, I am amazed that in five sentences, I have already arrived at toilet questions. <laughs> so this incinerating toilet is aptly named Cinderella, and it converts human waste into sterile gray ash. That's great, but you know, I'm also interested in religion, and so my YouTube feed is also full of religious offerings. So 99% of all those videos explain how others are wrong and they are right. There are very little nuanced arguments. There is almost no wrestling with the human condition and no one seems to discern God's will. Everybody is sure that everybody is wrong but me. And I understand people who look at the religious offerings on the web and think, hey, are there not enough problems on this planet that could use some real theological insight? And obviously the church is the wrong place to look for said religious insight. All the church on the web offers is celebrating itself and condemning all others. And then I read through the text for today and I think <laughs> some things never change. Nobody in this text really wants to know what they pretend to ask. They really, the literary don't care if it is lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not. All they care about is setting a trap for Jesus that proves that Jesus is wrong. And the Pharisees and the Herodians are strange bedfellows. The first hate the Roman Empire and see it as an agent of God's wrath intended to punish the people until they return to God. And the other thing, the empire is the best thing since sliced bread because Herod, the guy they support, is a puppet king of Rome. And when the puppet king does as he's told, keep the Roman peace and let the taxes flow, he will be richly rewarded. Herod gets a cut of the taxes that are squeezed out of the people, and the Herodians, Herod's supporters, get a cut of the cut. And that is lucrative. It seems that both groups only unite so far as they see Jesus as their enemy. And so they want to lower him into a public debate in which he can be proven wrong. When he's opposed to paying taxes, he's a rebel. And when then the Herodians can go and accuse him. And when he endorses paying taxes, he's a blasphemer because only God has a right to impose taxes. And then the Pharisees can go and accuse him. Nobody, nobody cares that God's will might be a mystery that needs to be explored, discerned, and contemplated from various angles. Everybody is convinced that God endorses what they think, whether on the dusty marketplaces of the Holy Land or the netherworld of today's internet. The world is full with people who know exactly what God wants, what God's plan is, and that God ordained them to trumpet it out into the world. And then in my sleepless nights, yeah. <clears throat> I encounter an especially annoying segment of internet theology. Disgruntled former ELCA clergy. Some make it their life's mission to expose the ELCA, to debunk the ELCA, to correct the ELCA, to denounce the ELCA, to tell the truth about the ELCA, and to predict that everybody in the ELCA will end up in a place that is considerably hotter than California. And no one of those arguments is even slightly interesting. 
Nothing of any substance. Nothing that is not completely self-centered, self-righteous, and self-obsessed. And I imagine God is as bored about them as I am, and I'm relieved that Jesus does the judging, and I don't have to. But these people point to a question of faith that cannot be ignored. And the question is, what is true? What's the difference between God's plan and human sentiment? And how do we tell the difference between the two? What can we be certain of? The basis of a faith are the scriptures. And according to Martin Luther, the Bible is the cradle in which the Christ child is laid. It is the vessel that contains the word of God. And that implies that you have to open the vessel and get the word of God out, or you have to lift the blanket or swaddling cloth to see the Christ child. And if you read scripture, most people who read scripture are extremely selective. They rip carefully selected, cherry-picked passages out of context. And when you do that, we, you end up with something that, that sounds coherent. And from that, you distill dogmas and teachings. And the content of most of these dogmas and teaching is do as we say, go to our church, think as we tell you, or God will hate you and throw you into a place that is considerably hotter than California. Or people reject scripture because scripture offends modern sensibilities. And yes, it is true, this scripture is hard to read when the knives come out and when there is talk about judgment. And the anti-judgment people only want to read the parts about love and holding hands and singing Kambaya. And most people ignore the parts of the Bible that, they, that don't conform to their expectations. But the stuff is there. Love is there and hate and judgment are also there. And ignoring one or the other doesn't make those verses go away. But what they do is they force us to show our colors. They make us reveal what we are all about. What kind of kingdom of God do we imagine? One that is for all people? Or do we imagine a, key, a kingdom of God that is just for people like us? Do we deal with the idiosyncrasies of human existence? Do we deal with the inconsistencies and contradictions of scripture? Are we able to live through that tension or do we throw half of the scriptures away and only keep what we like, understand and agree with? In the end, the question is, how do we deal with the mystery of God? And the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the ELCA, is a big tent. And in our assemblies, I meet colleagues who have a theology that makes me wonder, how come that we are in the same church? But thinking about that, it is rather a feature of organized religion than a flaw. If you want to be in complete theological agreement, your only chance is a mountaintop experience where it is only you and God and all the messy world stays far away. And Roman Catholics, for instance, have codified their theology into canon law. And that sounds like a way to come up with ironclad teachings that spell out exactly what is true and what isn't. Why don't we do the same? And I would argue that's an exercise in futility, despite claiming to be one Roman, one church, Roman Catholics are theologically diverse as any bunch of Protestants. Pope Francis, for instance, inspires a lot of theological dissent, no matter that he is in a position uh, to turn his theological insights into dogmas that can't be questions. Whatever he says will be questions. Whatever any theologian says will be questioned. And maybe, just maybe, maybe those questions lead somewhere. And maybe the Pope has an insight that propels Lutheran theology to new heights. Or maybe the next great insight comes from a Jew. 
or from a Muslim or a Hindu or ooh, an atheist. God uses strange angels to reveal God's will. <laughs> God gave us a Jewish son for the Christian world to follow. If that is no irony, I don't know what is. And when I zap through YouTube, I have to make a decision how to deal with all those voices that explain how I, <clears throat> how we are irredeemably wrong. Most of the Christian world can find common ground in spelling out how wrong the ELCA is. And I look at that angry faces and I have to decide whether to take offense and then craft the mother of all comebacks. <laughs> or I explore how to wire a Cinderella toilet into the electrical system of an old ambulance. <laughs> I think I choose the latter. People are passionate about RV bathrooms more than I thought possible. To us, God speaks Lutheran, and it really doesn't matter what others think or what they say. What matters is that we discern God's call for our community and that we find the courage to follow God's call. It is an integral part of Lutheranism that we deal critically with our faith, our piety, polity, and practice. We rarely deal with unchangeable dogmas, but we deal with how we understand God in the context we find ourselves in. We know that humans are capable of almost saintly acts of love, but we do not deny the dark side of our characters. We are both sinners and saints at the same time. We try to distinguish between God's voice and the voice of culture, which camouflages itself as a divine whisper. And sometimes we figure out the difference, and sometimes we don't. When we fail, we do not despair, but we try again. We do not try to be holy or pure, but we try to live lives that are worth living. We reach out to people of different faith, and we work together where we can. We try to be helpful to those in need and protective to those who need protection. We try to create safe spaces for all of God's people. And our communion is open to all who feel called to the table of the Lord because we are not God's gatekeepers. And if people think that is wrong, we hope that they find God elsewhere. We save our excitement and passion for things that matter. Amen.